Hello and welcome to another episode of Soul Nectar Show, that show where we talk about all things essence, where we gather around the campfire and we share our stories of connection to that which is bigger than us, to the great mystery beyond the veil, to what it is we're doing here, our soul's curriculum, what we're supposed to experience or we are experiencing and how do we process all this stuff? How do we even process our life experience and make sense of it? And I'm your host, Carrie Hummingbird, and I love these uh, conversations. They help me to put perspective on things. They help me to open my mind to new potentials and to understand things in a new way, which I really find helpful on my journey of what I like to call walking the beauty way, which is an indigenous teaching around seeing the beauty in everything that's happening in your life and um, knowing that it's for you, not against you, and that it's going to move through you if you allow it and something even better is going to come. That's the path I've been walking for the last 11 years, and I invite you to this perspective. And so today's guest is somebody that I actually saw um, teach uh, a segment at a conference I was recently at, and it was so powerful and clear, the description she had about karma, and we're going to go into this in a little bit, but I just had to bring her on the show. So I wanted to introduce you guys to Lisa Engels Witter. Welcome, Lisa. Hi, Carrie. Thank you so much for having me. I am so excited. So let me tell the audience a little bit about you. Um, Lisa is a psycho-spiritual counselor and coach that spent over 20 years working with spiritually-minded, high-performing professional women and men who want to break free of the anxiety, stress, worry, and overwhelm caused by repeating the same mistakes over and over. Anybody out there got the same mistakes coming again. Mm -hmm. So uh, most of Lisa's clients have already invested in therapy and coaching and personal and spiritual growth programs, but hit a plateau and can't seem to break through to the next level, no matter what they try. And so she has a karma clearing process that um, we're going to hear a little bit about today um, that really helps to restore that inner calm focus and emotional resilience to get meaning, purpose, and deep gratification, which I think we all agree would be wonderful to experience. Uh, so Lisa, I always start the show by asking a little bit about how did you become the person you are today, relevant insights to help us understand who you are and how you came to be this guy that you are today? Wow, great question. Um, well, Probably like most of your guests, I'm assuming, knowing the little bit that I know after reading some of your book, um, probably like most of your guests, I've known my whole life what I'm here to do. Um, so I always tell people I've never had a normal job and my parents weren't really happy about that when I was in my <laughs> 20s. <laughs> they were like, why don't you just get a normal job? I'm like, because I don't fit in that way. It doesn't, it's not going to work for me. Um, so anyway, backtrack. Um, I guess I just always knew that I was here to help people, um, but how that manifested originally was, a, a, I might say, an obsession with peak performance. Like I was an athlete and um, at the same time, I was also very much, this was like in the 80s, uh, I was really into visualization and meditation and um, I would always do that before any competition. Um, and a little bit outside of everybody else in my world of my friends and just sort of not didn't quite, I never fit in. Um, but I was really obsessed with this whole thing of peak performance. And I realized, okay, well, um, I was an athlete. So I studied in school, I studied exercise physiology and kinesiology. But at the same time, I was doing all of this meditation stuff as well. And at that time, after I got out of college, it wasn't so popular, mind, body, health, and wellness, that wasn't a thing. Like, it was Gold's Gym, or whatever. <laughs> it was bodybuilders. It was, nobody was interested in how do you combine this mind, body, spirit thing, and I was. And so, um, even though I was a personal trainer, and I call that my past life, helping people to achieve their highest physical potential for me, it just, it wasn't enough. And so I, I really um, dove into the more human potential piece of it. And again, was trying to 
put in the spiritual piece, but even in the human potential movement, it's very cognitive behavioral therapy. It's very much focused on just the mind. You know, it's not so much the spirit. So I went from helping people reach their highest physical potential to helping people reach their highest, you know, physical and mental potential. And eventually by the time I was 30, I'm like, okay, I just have to go with the spiritual piece. And that was when I stepped into this role of being um, more interested in and incorporating more in the work that I do, um, the psycho-spiritual coaching and counseling with people. So the trajectory of my work was always the same, highest potential, whether that's physical, mental, emotional, or spiritual. And now it's just sort of all, and I'm also very much an advocate for, um, not just spiritual evolution, but social evolution, right? So yeah, social bit. evolution, like healing it from the inside out. Um, I think as each of us does our own work, we contribute to the greater puzzle, certainly of our own ancestry, which of course then leads to healing for the planet. Um, that's why I do the work anyway. And I appreciated you were talking about the karma. You had some really good distinctions about karma because I will confess that myself, when I talk about karma, I tend to have that viewpoint that you said that we would have. <laughs> what you talked about, you said, well, you probably think it's a bad thing. And I'm like, yeah, like I definitely have had that idea. Like what karma am I creating? Am I creating negative karma right now? Or am I, am I taking an action that is for the highest good, even though it's uncomfortable right now because somebody doesn't like it? Um, you know, there's a lot of questions for me around like karma and how it gets generated and how um, we interact with other people to create it and how we can ameliorate maybe some of the effects of um, other people maybe not liking some of the choices we make. Of course, I, as a messenger, I often am in this spot of saying things that for me are very true. And then maybe some people in my private life may not like some of the things that I say, right? Might take it personally or misinterpret what I'm saying and then create some karma around that. So I would love your explanation of karma. Um, help us to understand like, what is it really? It's not a punishment, right? It's something else. So what is it? Right. Well, okay. So there's... <laughs> Let me first make some distinctions on this word karma because the word karma itself is just a Sanskrit word that means action. That's all. That's all karma means. When most of us speak of karma, we're actually referring to karmic results, which is what you're talking about. Yes. The results of our actions. So we need to make those distinctions between karma and karmic results. We're always doing karma because we live in manifest reality um, at the level of relative reality in which we live, the law of karma governs everything. Um, so we just have to realize you can't escape karma. Swami Vivekananda, um, who brought Vedanta and the Vedanta Society here to the United States back in the late 1800s, he had a saying that was good, good, bad, bad, and none escape the law. So good actions create good karma, bad actions create bad karma, re karmic results, I should say. But none escape the law, which means that if you were born and you're a human, you are governed by the law of karma. Now, um, our, the law of karma says that for every action or for every cause, there's an effect. So that's just the law of karma. We know that every time we uh, take an action at some point in time in the future, there'll be an effect, whether it's you know a moment from now, a year from now, 10 years from now, or another lifetime. Because in uh, Indian philosophy, inherent with understanding karma is you have to you also take on the, the understanding that there's the belief in multiple lives or the infinite life. Um, and so while it's easy to think that karma is created by action or karmic results are created by action, that in fact is not, the, not quite where it begins. <laughs> 
it actually begins much before that. And this is where it gets really interesting in Eastern spiritual tradition or yoga wisdom traditions. Um, and to me was the thing that I was missing. Like it was the missing link for me in understanding karma because um, previous to that, I was just like, okay, well, it's just actions and results, actions and results. But what, what the teachings tell us is that, in fact, it's not just actions and results. It all actually begins with a misunderstanding of the truth of who we are. So, in other words, not being able to answer the question, who am I, fully, or even... I'm going to just say correctly, <laughs> air quoting, correctly, right? So when we have a misconception, this is how it sort of plays out. When we have a misconception of who we really are, we don't know who we are. We think that we're someone that we're not. Then that, what that leads to is this feeling of not being whole. I'm not whole. I'm not complete. That feeling of not being whole, not being complete leads to desire. Desire for what? Desire to fill that hole, to fill this in what feels like for a lot of people, a nagging sense that something is missing. There's this inescapable void. And that desire to fill that inescapable void leads to taking actions that are motivated by attachment or aversion. And it's those two types of actions attachment and aversion that are what we might call selfish action. They're egoic actions. Um, they're actions that lead us either towards or away from someone or something. It's those types of actions that are going to cause karmic results. So, so when we look at it, really, it's not just action and, and the effects of our action. There's like two steps before that. The fundamental cause of karmic results is a misconception of who, we uh, of who we really are. I call it a case of mistaken identity. So this is how yoga wisdom tradition looks at it. And I know that there's other, um, other ways or other uh, systems of looking at karma, but this is just the system that I come from and, and use in my work. So hopefully that made sense. Yeah, no, that's, I love the distinctions there, um, that it's action, karma is action, action leads to results. And it's the who you're being when you take the action that probably also what you're saying is who you think you are as you're taking the action influences the outcome. Right, exactly. So the way I say it is that when we're mistaken or we have a misconception of who we are, we take misguided actions. Mm -hmm. Our actions are, are not coming from the truth. They're coming from some type of illusion, some type of misunderstanding. And, and as we all know, when we take uninformed action, it's always going to lead to pain and suffering, or at least suffering, if you're <laughs> talking in Buddhist terms, right? Yeah, it's kind of like, um, what I've noticed for myself is that if I'm in my knowing of who I am, and I always use Paul Selig's um, work to, to get there, it just supports me, it's a different pathway, but I also love yoga and things like that. But I like these mantras, because it's like, I know who I am in truth, I know what I am in truth. I know how I serve in truth. I am here. And in that dropping into that contemplation of what that is, then something else opens up with me that's generally way more spacious and beyond my current circumstance. And that aspect of self generally is has access to things like compassion and a higher perspective and forgiveness and uh, isn't so quite so attached to how things are going. And so for me, it's like the trick is to get to that place sometimes when I'm maybe in something that feels dense or sticky, you know, denser. To me, it's a, it's a sensation because I'm a feeler. So I can feel when it's, and it's more dense in my humanness or when it's more expanded in the bigger aspect 
of me that I am that is sees that this is all just a cosmic play. You know, this is this is an this is a whole illusion that's happening right here. And when I'm in my humanness, it sure feels real. You know, right. so I mean, it's a good. Um, so this is you're making another distinction, which is really really critical is the distinction between who we are in relative reality and who we are in absolute reality. And um, I always say that most people only answer the question, who am I from the perspective of relative reality? And when you're only answering the question, who am I from the perspective of relative reality, you're missing half of the, the answer. You only got you only got half of the answer of who you are because you're missing the part about absolute reality too. And, and of course, we have a lot of people now is is we're all experiencing that so many people are awakening to the truth of who they are in absolute reality. But then what happens without practice? In my experience, um, it's easy to become ungrounded and and not be able to ground that understanding, that awakening in relative mm -hmm. reality. So it is that old saying of, um, you know, you have to be in, in the world, but not of it. Uh, and, um, and it's that awareness of who I am simultaneously in relative reality and in absolute reality that that's sort of like the what I sort of think of as the sweet spot, right? It's it's like okay, if I can always be in that simultaneous awareness of who I am and not feel like I have to be one way or the other, you know, to the exclusion of the other, but I can actually be in practice of being in both at the same time. If that I makes love, sense. yeah, I know, I love that. I've been playing around with um, the space I'm in when I'm speaking and who I'm being as I'm speaking mm -hmm. and where it's coming from as I'm speaking nice. and and working to drop into my heart and into my soul higher guided self for the energy of the communication of the message and from that space I I feel a lot of times, most of the time, most of my life is fairly much in flow. I would say 90% of my life now, because I feel mm -hmm. like that um, alignment of soul leads to a flow. And it's just sort of like a constant flow and things are just happening and I'm just rolling with it. And it's all in front of me. So I'm not trying to force it. I One of my gene keys is the gene key of force. It's the shadow of force which is a beautiful, a beautiful attribute. That's what, that's what helped humanity stand up, you know, like made our spine straight and we could stand. So there's a great aspect of force. And when combined with judgment, which is my other gene key shadow, <laughs> not so fun, right? Like right. force and judgment together, a, a, a lethal concoction. So how do we move ourselves, you know, through these, you know, I'm bringing in like gene key stuff now, which is a little, uh, outside of the what we're talking about, it's all related, but it's just to to illustrate the point that I feel like there's these like the human aspect of self is in these sort of shadowy territories where um, it can be very dense and sticky and confusing and um, separation is there and don't know you know you don't not feeling supported loved or held or whatever the situation might be, and then as moving up in frequency, there's more access to um, the gifts and to seeing things through new eyes that even seeing the shadow and the judgment and the force through new eyes, can there can be an appreciation for the shadow from that higher perspective. And I think that's the soul's journey that we're talking about in, in understanding karma. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so, um... There is a purpose to karma. Um, again, like I said earlier, if you have a form, if you're here in, in, in body, then, then you're dealing with karma. And I don't believe that the universe would give us karma for no reason, just to make us suffer. That's actually not the reason why we have karma, at least from the perspective of yoga. 
um, wisdom traditions. So the purpose of karma is simply to help us um, gain knowledge and gain knowledge of what? Gain knowledge of the truth. Gain knowledge of the truth of what? Gain knowledge of the truth of who you really are and the true nature of reality. So all of the stickiness, I love that, um, that word and that imagery too, I can really sense it, is, um, would be indicative of a karmic pattern or our karmic patterns, right? And all, almost all of our karmic patterns are revealed to us through our relationships with others. And it doesn't mean an intimate relationship or um, anything like that. I mean, that's the other thing. I think, it, at least from this perspective, there is no such thing as a car, like some relationships being karmic and others aren't karmic. Any significant relationship you're in, whether it's intimate or friendship or colleague or whatever, is a karmic relationship. Um, so when we get that, we start treating people and our situations much differently. The thing with karma and kar the karmic patterns in relationship, why it's so, why they're so important is, as you know, I'm sure you teach this or, or talk about this, is that relationship is a path to spiritual awakening. And that's that's why we're here. We're here to awaken to the truth of who we are and liberate ourselves from our karmic patterns. Or you could say liberate ourselves from the mental constructs and stories or whatever it is. So that's the project of yoga, awakening and liberation. And I'm going to just say an aside that I like to say, because <laughs> I think it's so true. In this day and age when there's tons of people who are really awakening, we are having a global awakening right now you can be an awakened asshole. So just because you're awakened- <laughs> So true. <laughs> doesn't mean that you're liberated from no. your, your shit. Calling people right? sheeple is not cool. <laughs> what's what's like that? Calling people sheeple. I've heard so many people say, oh, those are those unawakened sheeple. And I'm like, that's not very awake. <laughs> no, <that's> <laughs> <laughs> to call people sheeple and unawake, that's not very awake. Like take a look in the mirror. I mean- yeah, but I've never heard that before, but that's so true. So, I mean, it sort of makes the point, right? Uh, there is so many people are having the experience of awakening, of touching into what everything that you've just, you know, have talked about, that place of being in the flow of spaciousness, of connectedness. So many people are experiencing that. We can't forget that we have to also work on liberating ourselves from our karmic patterns, which is the words you used was like that stickiness, that dense, that's karmic patterns. And um, so relationships offer us this wonderful opportunity to see ourselves, to get to know ourselves better. And um, I'm, I just finished a course called, um, teaching a course called Karma and Relationships. And it was really challenging for some of the people in that course to keep coming back to themselves. They kept wanting to look at, well, that other person did this in this relationship. I'm like, well, it's all about you. It's not about the other person. When we're looking at karmic patterns, we're looking at the nature of how we relate to others and relate that word relate means how do we act interact and react with others because those are I think you said it in the very beginning that that's what creates more karma <laughs> more karmic patterns or or deepens the karmic patterns and karmic structures if that's a really challenging one I have to confess I mean I'm still on a learning journey with it as well I think that we all are if we're in a body we're still <laughs> learning and from what I understand I've I follow um Kaipacha Lesher and he he laid out this entire spectrum of like on the planet what humanity has been focused on for the last thousands of years Mo the majority of the planet's been focused on acquiring material wealth and being like safe and secure in our material you know security <laughs> basically and now we have just tipped the balance over into the next lesson um that humanity is exploring which is relationships like you're talking about 
And so we're just tipped the balance where that's like going to be the primary focus and this materialism thing is going to kind of subside a little because it's not going to be as important. So we're going to go more into like these relationship things. Boy, these are really important. There's going to be a lot of focus on it. And I can already see it happening. You know, it's all around me. But what's interesting is um, I myself, you know, I, a lot of times it's so much easier to see it in another person that when there is like in a group and I love group mentoring because it's just so wonderful to watch people go through things and then I can see myself in it like oh I'm totally stuck on that one too oh wow okay I can see it so much better because they're going through it and we call that doing the work for everybody in the group (laughs) because they're the ones on the hot seat or the heart seat as my mentor calls it but I I really love that and and I, I love to learn and watch other people because sometimes when it's mine it's so close in that it it's like it's hard to, I'm aware, I'm now aware that righteousness is a trap for me. If I feel righteousness, I'm definitely in my ego. There's a problem going on. Like, you know, <laughs> stop all communication, you know, <laughs> like stop, dro- drop and breathe. You know, if I'm in righteousness, um, I am definitely need to like calm down. And, um, and these are just things I know about myself. I've recently been triggered by a situation. So that's close to me. And it's a, it's a, you know, especially these ones that come in our family dynamics and they're like really long and they keep happening over and over. And you're like, when is this person ever going to stop like acting this way? It's so tempting to put it out there. And I've recently had this huge success with my new book, A Love is Fears, Healing the Mother Wound, where I actually realized, oh, that's my story. That's actually my creation from childhood about who she is that I just got reinforced over and over and over again. And then as soon as I was able to release it through a variety of methods, including plant medicine, she changed. Like I did it without expecting her to change because you can't make anybody else change. But when I did it, it was like all of a sudden something opened and now we're having a new relationship. So I know it works, but I still get like when somebody does the old pattern with me, you know, somebody else. Now there's another one that's risen up for healing. So like, oh God. I know that you love how, face this now. I love how you, we keep getting the test over and over and over again. And we know that our karma is clear or that we've, we know that a karmic pattern has been cleared when we're no longer triggered by that. I mean, it's a really easy one, right? You're just no longer triggered by that thing happening. But as you're saying, you know, you work through it with someone and then, okay, here comes the next person. Oh, now I know a little bit more. I'm still getting triggered, but now I'm a little bit more aware. I have more awareness around it that you work through that one. And then maybe another person comes and it's even less. And then again, and it's even less until finally um, it's gone. But the truth is like in all of this, uh, you touched on it, you did it, you were implying it, is it requires radical compassion. It requires radical compassion for ourselves in taking responsibility for the actions that have caused hurt to ourselves and others that we may not have realized. And it requires radical compassion for others and remembering, oh my gosh, they're just like me. And I have this um, belief, um, and, um, or maybe, I don't know if it's a belief or a wish or a little bit of both is that, or maybe it it sounds unrealistic, but I really feel like, wow, if this could happen, if we all really understood the truth of who we are, if we could answer that question, who am I? And be stabilized in our felt understanding and knowing of the truth of who we are, that that we would clear karmic patterns quite quickly because I can't look at someone who's been a per- perpetrator to me and not have compassion for them because beneath their actions, beneath the horrible things that they did, I have the understanding of the truth of who they are. It doesn't mean that they get a free ticket out of jail, um, so to speak, for the wrongs that they committed, but it does mean that I can see them. I perceive the truth of who they are. And to me, that's radical compassion, which is also a radical act of love. Love is a perception when we can see the truth of who another really is. So, so that piece is 
ties into it so much. And it's hard to forget that like, oh yeah, I have to have compassion for myself. And when we bring in the final piece is like when we bring in this understanding of um, reincarnation or past lives, or as Robert Thurman calls it, the infinite life, which I love that that metaphor, the infinite life, we've lived infinite lives, we start to understand ooh, this person, this family member, I mean, our birth family is where our main karmic patterns show up. And if we have someone in our birth family who's been really challenging to us, the radical compassion piece is very useful when we realize, oh yeah, just like me, they've lived probably hundreds, if not thousands of lives, and they have karmic traces and karmic patterns that they're bringing into this life, just like me, to work out. And I get to do this with them because we're both working through a, you know, probably complementary karmic patterns that are triggering each other. And so um, I was actually working through this with a client just the other day in the karma and relationships course, um, and helping her to see that one of her siblings was actually, even though there was such tension between them, if we could just sense like, just like me, this person came into this lifetime with karmic patterns and they're working them through with you. What an opportunity, you know? So, yeah. Yes. And, um, and I love that. I know that there's matching patterns and I know that it's almost like, um, this is a little off and strange, maybe, uh, maybe seem completely irrelevant, but I was watching, I like to watch Supernatural. <laughs> and there was this episode where um, they were killing the four horsemen, like they were, because they killed supernatural things and they were working with war. And the interesting thing about war was that war caused everybody to see the other people as demons so when they have demons they have the black eyes so this group was seeing that group has black eyes oh my god they're demons they've been turned and then this group was seeing that group and they're like no you're the demons like you're totally the ones that have been turned and i feel like that is like a metaphor for what's happening in the world today where it's like people are just seeing what their their maya the illusion or their soul's curriculum is setting them up to see so that they can move through that to the better, you know, not better, but to the more true understanding that there's a bigger thing going on that's creating this whole illusion and that yeah. it's, it's not true. Right. Yeah. And, and I, that's such a great image of the, the demon eyes because that's what we do. The only way you can perpetrate, the only way you can hurt another is to dehumanize them, you know, to really think that it's okay to hurt another human being is because you've dehumanized them. You've made them other than you. But if we understood that if we were able to see the truth of who we really are and that at the level of the absolute reality, we're all one true self, one Atman, one, you know, Buddha nature is whatever you want to call that, that thing in absolute absolute reality we're all that um it's i i mean I, I feel like yeah it's the change that changes everything and like you said we just have this the the karmic patterns and in, in my terminology the karmic patterns cause us to perceive reality different from what it really is like that's what it does and that's why um it to me, it's so critical to have practice, to have yeah. your spiritual practice. Um, I just heard this the other day that Eric Fromm said, um, insight without practice is ineffective. So who cares if you have all this insight and you've done all this therapy or you've gone to your weekend workshop or your retreat and you've got all this insight about yourself? Who cares? Unless you you now do your practice and embody that insight, right? So, so true, yes. So, so many people um, do that, like um, have a lot of insight and, and get addicted to the insight, but brush off the practice. And um, it's like, how do you stay motivated to do practice 
because most people, you know, oh, meditation. I'm sitting there. I know it's good for me. I know I should do it. But you, you don't want to go to your meditation cushion because you should do it, right? <laughs> you want you want to go because you feel the longing to to know the truth of who you are, so that you yes. can, so that you can be. Um, you know, so that you can truly have inner peace and happiness. That's what should draw you to your practice is that tapping into that longing. Um, and that's the only way I think um, that's the, to me, that's the answer to, well, how do I motivate myself to do the practice? The insight is fun. To me, the insight is fun. It's like, ooh, I just found out this thing about myself. <laughs> that's crazy. Oh, now I have to do the practice. <laughs> now I have to actually live it and embody it. Like, uh, like when I channeled that book, I would give you the second wave. So many insights in that book and revelations and remembrances and like it was awesome channeling that book. I was like, yeah, yeehaw. And I'm just like learning from it too. And I love that. That's also why I love these conversations because I always learn from it. And then, you know, like for example, the one the last chapter is a courageous heart. Well, dang, you know, it's not just write the book and put it out there. It's actually lean in it's have the conversations, it's allow spirit to move through me, open up the can of worms that I don't want to open up because let sleeping dogs lie and don't go there because it's just going to be a conflict. And then, but spirit's nudging and nudging and nudging. And I feel like that's the case of a lot of people who it's almost like a blessing to wake up and then a curse on the backside because now you're the only like sober person in the room. <laughs> And everybody else is drunk. And if you've ever gone to a party where like you're the only sober person in the room and everybody else is drunk, it's like, what do I do with myself? All these people are drunk. And, you know, it's like I'm hanging out with a bunch of drunk people and they don't know they're drunk. That's the thing. They don't know that they're into that they're intoxicated or deluded like that. They think it's normal. And it's like, whoa. And then trying to explain it, you can't explain it right away because people aren't ready to hear that. And if you I've learned if you try to explain it too soon, they get they get really angry actually, and they lash out. So what do you recommend for people? Because I know you've walked this path. I can tell by yeah. everything you're saying. Um, well, one of my very wise teachers, <laughs> <laughs> um, she's very, very adamant about uh, uh, keeping, uh, not imposing on someone else's karma, which means that if someone isn't ready, that you never offer pearls uh, what's that saying pearls no pearls before food. a swine yeah don't offer pearls to a swine which i've done before and then get all upset that they didn't you know the person didn't get like the beauty of the little piece of whatever that i was sharing which is what you're saying i've learned at this point i just keep my mouth shut and don't like I it's about discernment discerning who's ready and who's not and we all are on our own path to awakening and liberation there's no doubt about that that everyone who's here every single person I don't care who they are the most horrible person in the world to the most saintly person in the world we're all on the same path we're just at different points on that path and it's our karma that we have to live out. You know, we have to go through our own process. I mean, I have a, a, a 18 year old daughter in college and uh, like as much as I would love to share some stuff with her, I just know where she, and just that temptation as a parent to be like, like ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, do I have a burning for you? <laughs> yeah, I'm like, but I just like keep my mouth shut because it's not my place to tell her or to give her this advice when she hasn't asked for it. So that was the point is my teacher said, unless someone specifically asks for it, don't give it to them. And, and that's a practice in and of itself. There are people who do want what, what you have to share and the knowledge that you have. And when you're in a room of the, the drunk people, like you're talking about, it's in those times that it's an opportunity to again not make it and 
me versus them, us, other, which is such a, an easy thing for me to do for sure to go, oh my God, I just, this, these people, I, how do I even relate to them? I'm immediately putting myself in the position of me versus them, other. Can I see the truth of who they are despite their beliefs and the words that they're saying and the actions that they're doing in the moment that are driving me crazy? Can I see beyond that and see, wow, just like me, they have unmet needs and this is how they're getting them met. It might not be very skillful, might not be the way that I would do it, but they have unmet needs and this is how they're getting them met. I right like that now. saying. I like that unmet needs. And you know, the need is love, actually, I think is that's the only thing there is and everyone's searching for is ourselves, which is love. But I, I'm really, I love this. And I also want to honor the reality. Like I, I want to honor that in the middle of that knowing, at least for myself, like I've had this recent situation, I said, I, I have full compassion. I see exactly, I know she's a soul. I see exactly why in this incarnation, she's stuck where she is in the pattern. I, I see it. It's like, okay, I understand you, you went through these things and this is, of course, that's the conclusion. I understand. And boy, it really sucks to be on the receiving end of it. Like it sucks to be on the receiving end of somebody who's really angry and hateful towards you. It's, it's like a, that energetic is not my favorite okay. energetic. I prefer other energetics. <laughs> It's really, really, really challenging. Again, radical compassion. It's, and in those moments of that, when you're the, the recipient of all of that anger, rage, hate, whatever it is that's coming at you, it, this is where the rubber meets the road of the practice. And we we get to see again, what's the nature of my relating to this person when they're in this mode towards me? What's happening with me? Make it about, again, about me. What am I doing? What are my reactions to that? Because that's showing me where I still have karmic patterns binding me. And you're absolutely right. Like, it's so not easy. <laughs> it's not, not easy. It's the master path. Yeah, it is a master path. Absolutely. And to hold love. And the thing is, like, it was great because I was really proud of myself. I was like, oh, good job, Cammie. Because I actually was able to get past my reaction and be like, oh my God, I totally used to do that to people like about a dozen years ago. That was me. I yeah, did that. I see that. I sent that. those emails. I and this is what it felt like for people to receive it. Oh my gosh, I can't believe I did that to people. I'm so sorry. No, I actually sent a few messages after to some friends that I know I did that to around along the way. And I was like, I just want to tell you, I'm really sorry that I sent you those stink bombs because I'm sure that really hurt and that sucked. And I'm just gonna squeegee it now retrospectively. <laughs> you know, beautiful. And you can, you know, that 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 counts as as um those actions really do heal those karmic patterns. They do. So it's, it's true. And when you said something that struck me, you know, patting yourself on your back, which is really good to remember in those moments that self-love and self-compassion is number one, not compassion for the other person. Actually, it's the opposite. I believe that's more important, just like the whole old analogy of the face mask in the airplane. <laughs> you yeah, put your mask on. Put your mask on. on, get, your mask on. <laughs> yes, put yours on first before you help anyone else. Same thing. It's very hard to be compassionate or forgiving or loving kindness to another when you haven't done that for yourself first. So in those moments, it's it's. It is, I think, really, really hard to be compassionate towards that radical compassion towards that person. Okay, first towards myself, radical compassion for myself. You know, I'm, I'm in this area. I've, you know, I, I see what's happening. Good job, self. <laughs> I just got a good little. I take a breath. Woohoo! <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then it's a little bit easier to, to extend that outward. We always go the closest in to us. And then we begin to slowly extend that compassion, that loving kindness outward further and further. So. 
Well, yeah. I want to ask you one more follow-up question at that, if that's okay, because I have a curiosity. Is it, what's your perspective on pent-up feelings? And, and you know, because there's a tendency to story, right? I know that I've had a tendency to story in my life, and I've been working on closing the gap on stories before they take off in life on their own. And mm. still, it feels like there's a thing, at least for a woman, I feel, like venting like to get it out, not to, you know, on somebody, but more to just release the, um, the release the story, I guess, let it set it free, let it out somehow. It feels like there is a certain amount of time to allow yourself to be witnessed or to let that, that feeling from the pattern that you're experiencing of it, that density, that stickiness to come out. Absolutely. There's, I mean, karmic patterns are thoughts and emotions, essentially. That's where they live in, in your, um, uh, in your uh, energy body, in the, they're the thoughts and emotions. So undigested emotions are going to feel, as you say, sticky. They are your karmic patterns. So you have to digest your emotions. Sometimes my experience is vocalizing them just reinforces them, doesn't really digest them. It reinforces the feeling, it, reinf it, it justifies, like I'm justified in this, I'm righteous. As I'm you righteous. Said, you know, like I'm righteous for feeling this way and I just have to vent it. If the tendency is to want to vent that much, then you have to look at why. Why is that? Why do you feel the need to do that. Now, I'm definitely not saying um, don't feel your feelings, but the practice I do with my clients around this is often being able to feel the feelings without having to do anything with them. In other words, I don't have to express them verbally. I don't need to go out and do something to that person. I don't need to tell anybody, but what I do need to do is feel the feelings without attachment or aversion. Like, am I so attached to this for feeling or am I like trying to avoid this feeling? And that is a very, very, very deep practice. And what you'll notice is when you're able to feel your feelings without attachment or aversion, that at some point, if you stay with it long enough, don't leave it, it just dissipates. And then that emotion has either been absorbed or it's been released. And that's the, the your emotions are going to do one of those two things. They're either going to be absorbed, digested, just like food. You absorb the nutrients and then you eliminate it out. Yeah. yeah. So the same thing happens with emotions. You absorb some of it, gets assimilated and works through, and then you release the excess that you don't need. So if you digested your emotions properly that's um what will happen fantastic i absolutely love that and that has been my experience and i'm really grateful for you saying all that because i went through it when i wrote that book <laughs> i really went through it i digested yeah. a lot and i'm really grateful that part is over that part so thank you i know that you have a free gift um to, for people to find out more about the, the karmic um, teachings that you have, do you want to share that with us now? And then I'll put that in the show notes as well. Um, yeah, you know what? If you lead people just over to karmic-warrior.com, on that page, there's a bunch of uh, different free offerings. So take your pick. Awesome. Thank <laughs> you so much, Lisa. I really appreciated this interview. I hope everybody out there found this fascinating. Is there anything you want to leave people with before we close or... Any last? I just want to thank you for this wonderful conversation. It's been a really fun conversation to have with you. And I love the flow of the conversation. And just, um, yeah, thank you so much for having me. Thanks to your listeners and viewers for tuning in. And um, hopefully we've opened up your uh, 
awareness a little bit around karma. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so that was really, I, I hope you guys enjoyed that. Cause when I heard her, I was like, oh yeah, I need to have her come on the show. Cause that was so clear. So thank you so much. And uh, remember everybody out there, please help us spread the message. Um, maybe not directly to somebody who might not be ready for this, but as, as Lisa and I were talking about, but share it out, you know, on your social media and then people can pick and choose if they want to, if they want to listen in or not. Um, but share it out, you know, cause you never know. Um, you might share it and the person that needs it it's really meaningful for them in that in that moment to find this uh this very message so um that's how we help the the wheels of, of transformation to keep rolling on and i want to encourage you to leave us a review and on uh, itunes or youtube or wherever you found it and now here come kisses so i always give people kisses on the way out here they come you can join me if you want here come your kisses everybody we love you <laughs> Thanks for joining us on Soul Nectar Show, and we'll see you next week. Bye for now.